Hello and welcome back to what I assume is going to be a long episode of The Littlest Petcast because I have at least 10 pages of notes, but that's okay because we're going over the two-part double feature, double length episode that ends season two, The Expo Factor. And we begin with Blythe running through a darkened room where they are holding the International Pet Fashion Expo. She can't find her kiosk and is getting worried. Young me, Sue, and Jasper appear holding watermelons and, and like telling Blythe things like, go find your kiosk and you can't be late for the judging and you want some watermelon from Jasper? And the announcement system blares out that Blythe has to report to her kiosk. She eventually finds her kiosk only to see that it is barren. And the judges creep up to her and she says she's not ready because her kiosk is empty. Her clothes are nowhere to be found. And we pan out and we see that she is wearing footy pajamas, and I believe holding a teddy bear. She then wakes up and complaining about this exact dream happening again, which is really kind of hilarious. <laughs> she wants this whole process to be over so she can get a good night's sleep. Later, she is talking to Emma on the phone about her dream, and she mentions that the particular footy pajamas she was wearing in the dream she has not worn since kindergarten. And Emma, being Emma, says, as we say in downtown city, chillax, Blythe. Which, is chillax still widely used by teens? Because I remember it being used widely by teens like 10 plus years ago i mean i even used it in a school presentation well not a school presentation a presentation for a class but either way i mean i don't know like apparently it's still in use when i looked it up like there were sources that were saying chillax in 2017 I don't think it's as hip lingo as it was, you know, back in 06 or whatever. And I did mention that uh, since I theorized that this takes place in the Ace Attorney universe, they also sometimes use outdated terms for things. Like, you know, when they make little references that were topical in, like, 06, 07, whatever, but might not be so topical 10 years down the line when those games took place. Anywho. So Emma continues by saying that it's Blythe's subconscious trying to freak her out. So Blythe is getting prepared for the day throughout all of this and she puts on a little bow on the side of her head that's important for something later it's not it's not that important but something anyway uh Blythe says that her subconscious is doing a very good job at freaking her out and then Blythe gets another call and asks to take it Emma says that uh she'll get off and stop by later to show pictures from the trips as well as have Blythe Look at the latest issue of Aspiring Tour Guides Monthly. Blythe asks, that's a thing? And Emma says, yeah, I publish it myself. (laughs) Which, Emma, I really like Emma as a character. I really wish she appeared outside of this season. I don't think she does. She might be in the background, but I don't know. Anyway, uh, I, lo- I, I love that 
<laughs> publishes her own magazine for something that appeals to her and probably only her. Uh, but it's so good, though. I love it. Anyway, so the other person calling Blythe is Mona Autumn. Mona immediately asks Blythe to take off her bow, which Blythe does, which is the importance of the bow, but, you know, whatever. Anyway, Mona says that since she's going to be a guest judge at the expo and has noticed that Blythe was going to be there, she wants to make an arrangement where Blythe can do a photo shoot with her and with whatever pets, and, you know, Blythe gets full creative control and uh like all of that because Blythe is basically spearheading the youth section of pet fashion and uh like Mona asks would you be honored and Blythe says she would be but Mona says that that was a rhetorical question of course he would so uh anyway Blythe gets really excited and goes downstairs to tell the pets about it and says that uh, when the edition of Très Blasé, where these pictures will be published in, uh, with them is going to come out, they will all be famous. But I would just just like to backpedal just a second here. Aren't technically Blythe, Sunil, and Zoe already kind of famous as is? Because, like, in, uh, like, the Nest Hats craze, Blythe invented a fashion craze. And in What Meme Worry, both Sunil and Zoe became memes. And even though it's, like... Like a 15 minutes of fame kind of thing. Like they should still be somewhat recognizable. Because like. Like I don't. I don't know how. Much I've heard from. Tezande. Since Chocolate Rain. But I still know who Tezande is. And. I don't know. It's just stuff like that. Where like. You know, a five or ten year old meme, especially if it's a real person, is still kind of recognizable to some extent. Like, I guess it's like the same with like using words that are like ten years old or more that were considered part of the hip lexicon of the day, and then just like transitioned into everyday use but I don't know it's it's uh it's just odd you know it's not it's not even my biggest problem with this episode believe me we're gonna get there and when I say we're gonna get there we're gonna get there where you'll see anyway but it's still something worth bringing up. Anyway, Blythe leaves for school and the pets talk about modeling. Vinny talks about how he's going to work it, but Penny says that she doesn't have to work it because she's so adorable, and Sunil agrees. Russell is worried because he is not the modeling type exactly and feels more behind the scenesy. So he says that Russell doesn't need to worry since all eyes are going to be on her, which eases Russell's fears. So Blythe at lunch is telling her friends about what she still needs to do for uh, the Pet Fashion Expo, and they reassure her that everything will be fine. Blythe thanks them, but then says, "Uh uh-oh, as she sees the biscuits spying on her. Blythe confronts the biscuits and they're spying. (laughs) Okay. They say... Oh, God, this scene. They say they're looking for a contact lens when Blythe says that they don't wear contact lenses. Uh, They don't retort by saying... 
something somewhat believable, like their designer contact lenses that, you know, change your eye color for a little bit for, you know, style or a costume. No, they say that they're not looking for their own contact lens, which is immediately suspicious because when do they do something for someone else? Alternatively, they could be looking for someone else's contact lens and ask a favor before returning it. Still, Blythe calls them out and says that they were spying for her for the IPFE. And the Biscuits say that if we were spying, which we weren't, it would be our regular everyday spying, not spying because of this big event. I I just kind of love this scene and how it characterizes the Biscuits as like, like before it's a weird sort of hatred fueled by the fact that Blythe didn't want to be their friend at first or do something with them at least. And now we kind of get a little glimpse into it where we kind of see that like, They're sort of jealous of Blythe and want to bring Blythe down to their level by, you know, spying and sabotage instead of, like, fixing themselves up. Because, like, I mean, they tried fixing themselves up, but they got in their own way by being a bit too selfish and not ready to share Blythe's dad with Blythe. Uh, yeah, their their whole characterization is something else. Cause cause they're evil, but they're not evil. Evil. They're just evil. I don't know. It's it's hard to describe, and it's gonna get a little harder as we go into future seasons. But for right now, they're evil and a little jealous, and I love that potent combination and combined with their kind of stupidity it makes for some interesting characters anyway they say that Blythe's kiosk is junkyard because they saw it when uh, Blythe landed right in front of the largest ever pet shop trying to drag her kiosk home and Young Me and Sue chime in and say that it might have been Junkyard when she got it, but Blythe fixed it up really good, and now it's completely retail. Is that how kids were talking back in 2014? They were saying, like, something is Junkyard and retail and stuff? Whatever. Why am I questioning the linguistic choices of teenagers? Anyway, Blythe uh, then says, if you don't believe me, why don't you check us out in the next edition of Très Blasé? The Biscuits are shocked and say that can't happen, but Blythe and her friends say, yeah, it can, and, you know, they leave, because unlike the Biscuits, they don't care about how the biscuits are feeling. And (laughs) it's just great. So Whitney asks Brittany not to tell anyone she forgot about this ippy effy thing. (laughs) And Brittany says, who would I tell? I also forgot. (laughs) And it's probably too late to enter. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) Like I said... Like, jealous, evil, and stupid. That is a a great combination for comedy. (laughs) Anyway, Whitney says that their dad has something big in the works, so they need to make sure that Blythe doesn't get any positive attention. And Brittany says it's never too late to mess with blech. (laughs) Oh, God. 
Uh, these these two are going to be the death of me. <laughs> anyway, so uh, in the halls, Blith gets a call from Mona. However, Mona says that she planned a theme for the photo shoot, City Girl Jungle Theme, and she asks Blythe if she was allergic to bananas. Blythe is a bit confused by this and then asks about how she could do anything. Mona says, did I say that? That doesn't sound like me. <laughs> Which, like, I mean, she did say it, but she is right. That does not sound like Mona Autumn. <laughs> It's, it's so good. Oh, this episode's actually really good so far. So, Mona also limits the number of pets to one in the pictures. Blythe gets even more upset because she already told them that they could all be in it. So, at the pet shop, someone drops off their cat. She introduces herself as Delilah... And she is almost offensively British. <laughs> she asks them to introduce themselves, but because of her British accent and language gap between British and American English, no one really understands her, and Russell just kind of guesses that that's what uh, she means. So they introduce uh, themselves... And Russell asks her about the pet fest because she says she's going. She says, yeah. And she says, yeah, I suppose we're going to be there. And uh, she also says that she is famous on a small scale in London. And Vinny asks if that makes any sense to Sunil. Sunil says no, but he finds that strangely appealing as hearts come out of his eyes. And Delilah says, I find you strange too, Ducky. Sunil says, she thinks I'm a duck, and then literally falls in a delirious state of love on top of Vinny. And speaking of Vinny and Sunil... I guess this is one way to backpedal if you want to backpedal on the idea that Vinny and Sunil are gay. But I don't know. Their their relationship is really close at the very least. Maybe it's like a Turk and JD vibe. And even that is a little gay at times because like they say they're a little married and you know they're proud to be as close as they are so I mean it doesn't matter whether or not they are or not, or not gay so I guess the same applies here so they say that they're going to be in a fashion shoot for très blasé but Delilah seems very blasé herself about photo shoots and says that when you've done them as much as she has, you get a been there, not sure why I did that kind of attitude. Zoe says, as another fashionista, speak for yourself. Delilah's like, who else can I speak for? I can only speak for myself. Sunil is still gushing through all of this. And Delilah says that, like, you know, I'm not trying to rain on your parade, but even, like, stuff like the Fashion Expo can get a little boring when, uh, when you've been doing it for as long as I have. Okay, I swear I'm trying my best to sound like her, but, like, you can, you can only do so much. <laughs> With a British accent. <laughs> and, you know, the not right gendered voice <laughs> for this. So Penny and Minka asks if uh, she could explain the expo. And then Delilah says, Ahem, I swear this is the actual line. Ahem. 
I suppose this is the part where you enter an alternate reality and I lay it out for you lot via sanguine musical vocalization and some rhythmic capering about, isn't it? That was my second take because I really had to focus on the word via to say it like that because normally I would say it via. Like, he got there via truck, not via truck. Which kind of sounds... Whatever, you know, it's... It's a weird, weird line, and we're going back into weird territory. But first, I do mention that, like, Sunil is almost upright, but falls over again because Delilah says that incomprehensible mess. Russell asks if that means they're going into a musical fantasy, and Delilah says, yeah, whatever. So, they again mention that they know stuff is fantasy in this, which I still find weird, but I don't know. Like, it's not as weird as dedicating an entire episode to that still a bit weird because I, I don't think it should work that way but like if, if you have the baseline already there where that's that's an established thing and they know their fantasies that no no that's still it's still no it's still bad I find that bad because that like it doesn't make any sense but, I mean, it's not as bad as, like, Day at the Museum. <laughs> uh, it's been a while since I said an episode wasn't as bad as Day at the Museum, hasn't it? Anyway. So, before Delilah goes into the song that they mention, she says that during these kind of things, she can get very upbeat. And Like, the techno starts, and it's a techno song. And I would argue that it fits well enough to the tone of the series. I mean, like, the Biscuits had that, like, techno-y song at their quarter birthday? (laughs) Uh, I keep forgetting how terrible these rich people are. (laughs) Anyway... So as the techno is starting up, Delilah says, All right, pet, let's eyes on the kitty. And then once that happens, the techno kind of like goes into the main portion. And it's a good but weird song. There's a lot of weird choices, but they're entertaining. Uh, she also mentions New York as a city that is represented in uh, the Fashion Expo, which I take as pure validation for my theory that Downtown City was once a part of New York City but broke off from the rest of New York City because New York is being represented in the Downtown City International Pet Fashion Expo. I am right. I swear I'm right. And I knew it all along. And I am flawed. I'm... uh, I couldn't resist. Anyway. So Delilah then explains the expo from a fashionista's perspective. And how pets from all around the world show up. And how every eye is on them. And there's a brief runway scene with Delilah on it. And the pets are looking on. Sunil is still a little love struck. While Penny just dances about. And it's really, really cute on her part. Anyway. So Delilah gives some of her fashion tips. And preps everyone. And gives them clothes for the runway. But all of the clothes are at least semi-British related. Minka has an outfit that is similar to something the queen would wear. 
Penny is either a Pacific Islander or Chinese in her outfit, which both of those territories Britain has some colonial ties to. Russell is a British punk rocker. Vinny is dressed as a mid to late 1700s upper class member of Western society with the powdered wig and something similar to what Edgeworth would wear. And I mean, even though they have like the fleur de lis in uh, the background of Vinny showing off this, I don't know, I still relate it more to English. I don't know, it's it's weird. Anyway, Zoe is wearing a like 60s fashion thing that feels British. Like she kind of has a bob cut and she has like really big round glasses and those like feel British to me. They're sunglasses, but they're still like they still they feel Austin Powersy, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that's that's the best way to describe it. So, uh, Pepper is dressed in a feminine version of the Queen's Guard, which just means she has a dress instead of pants or trousers, if you will. And Sunil is wearing an outfit from India, I believe, to relate to his Indian heritage, which is famous for being colonized by Britain and breaking loose from uh, colonial control. Which, I mean, I guess kind of begs the question of why Sunil doesn't understand British English if he's from India. And, I mean, I guess the answer is because he lives in the U.S. and has for at least a while. But, I mean, them bringing up India and England in this capacity does bring up the question, even if it's already been answered. It makes you think, but then you think of the other context this show has given you. It's still weird. Anyway, uh, we see a few of the other pavilions as uh, some other animals uh, represent them as well. And then they go on the runway and strut their stuff. And the song kind of ends abruptly and they acknowledge it, which is both funny and a bit weird. But, you know, it's not it's not like Day at the Museum where, like, Blythe literally had to grab them out of the fantasy. It just kind of ends. So... Upstairs in Blythe's room, young me and Emma are there admiring her travel photos. Young me says that their trips to Paris and Brazil looked good. And Emma compliments her Shanghai trip as well, even though she wasn't there to guide her for it. Blythe says that it was, and it helps influence her designs. Like how she worked the Great Wall of China into a dog sweater, even though that's nowhere near Shanghai, they were only in Shanghai, and they only went to the Great Wall in a fantasy which Blythe was not a part of. Emma, after seeing the dog sweater, says, I wish I was a dog, and both Blythe and young me look at her, And she says, I mean, so I could wear a cool sweater. (laughs) Young Me says that Blythe should think about doing people fashion. Blythe says, maybe someday, but I like doing pet fashion. Which, I mean, I guess, I don't know. Blythe did start out by drawing human fashion. And she just, like, transitioned into animal fashion to A, save the littlest pet shop. And then afterwards, like, it makes her money, so why why not keep doing it? And, like, you know, people fashion is kind of hard, and, you know, you get a little more leeway 
on getting into it big time with, uh, you know, if you have experience and what better experience than pets? And hey, they like it. They like it. The designs are good. And, you know, you already got the attention of Mona Autumn, a fashion industry mogul. Blythe is really off to a good start with her potential fashion career. So, Blythe is still upset about being limited to one pet and how everyone else will be disappointed. Emma says, it's not like you think that the pets can understand what's going on, because that'd be crazy talk. (laughs) Blythe goes on about how she can't make up her mind because all of the pets are cute and they have different styles and body types, so she doesn't know what clothes she wants to feature. Yada, yada, yada. Cover off. Anyway, Emma says that this really isn't something for her to fret over, so just put the names in this hat and let fate decide. So they do that, and the name they draw is Russell. Blythe says that Russell is cute and all, but so is everyone else. She is firm on what the hat has to say, though, and sticks with it. The biscuits peer into Littlest Pet Shop and see Blythe's kiosk. They agree that it's no longer junkyard. However, Whitney sneaks in, and Brittany asks what she's doing. Whitney says that she wants to make it junkyard again. So they agree to sabotage it. So uh, they do the thing where they sneak, and then they sneak right behind something, and they're completely concealed. And then they steal... A dog bag, a dog food bag, and they sneak over like it's an honest to goodness Scooby Doo cartoon, which, I mean, it's not the worst thing. <laughs> so, anyway, they get up to it, but before uh, they can do anything, they hear Mrs. Trombley yell out, Don't you dare! and stuff like that, and they freak out and run away. But Mrs. Tombley was yelling at her tablet about the big project that Fisher Biscuit is working on. So Blythe comes down to the play area and everyone gathers. Delilah is curious about Blythe's ability to speak to animals. So she says, They tell me you can speak to us. So what did I just say? And then Blythe says, I'm going to have to use the same British accent because she replies in a British accent. That's the thing. They say you can talk to us pets. So what did I just say? I guess. If I had to knock it up an octave. And Delilah says, ooh, she's good. And then asks Zoe how good Blythe is at back scratching. And Zoe says, the best. Blythe says that she heard someone was coming today and that she must be Delilah. And she goes over and scratches Delilah's back, which Delilah is very much enjoying because she purrs. Uh, Sunil asks if she could join in the photo, but Blythe tells everyone that Mona has said that the modeling gig can only go to one pet. She explains the fair method of randomly pulling a name out of a hat to determine who should get the gig, and it ended up being Russell. Both Russell and Zoe are shocked, and Russell says to do a redo, and it just so happens that Blythe was wearing the hat with the names in it, and they pull it down, and, uh, you know, they pick a name out, and it is, again, Russell. So Zoe tries, and the rest of the pets try, but it always comes up to Russell. However... Penny picks it up upside down and reads it as Lesseur, but then corrects herself. And then Delilah picks one and it says, Delilah. Nah, just kidding. It's Russell. And <laughs> that's pretty good. Anyway, Blythe says that the hat is spoken. Russell says he doesn't want to, but Blythe says that she'll make sure it's great and that uh, he'll be really helping her out. Russell says he'll do it if it helps her out. Meanwhile, Mrs. Tombley calls for Blythe, and Blythe 
goes to Mrs. Trombley. Zoe gives Russell some grief about this, but then Pepper and Penny interrogate her about that. Zoe reveals that she's upset that the hat picked Russell, and Pepper agrees that Zoe should have been chosen, but she wasn't. Russell was. So they tell Zoe to help Russell in these trying times for him, and Zoe says it's not easy being a diva. Anyway, Mrs. Trombley has Blythe look at the article she was reading. It turns out that Fisher Biscuit is planning to open up a second largest ever pet shop in downtown city. So I guess there goes my burrow theory. Sort of. So I still maintain that Littlest is a burrow in downtown city. But largest ever is not. And Fisher was just browsing through the littlest district when he saw the littlest pet shop. And since he didn't know the boroughs, uh, he just thought it was like convention. So he just upped the convention and made largest ever. And since he's a businessman, it's, it's a chain. And not like, you know, mom and pop homebrew store where it's named after the district it's in, or borough, rather. So that is how I'm writing around that. Let us continue. Blythe and Mrs. Tombley are reasonably upset about this, but Mrs. Tombley, always ready to look on the bright side, suggests that Blythe use this expo to help promote the littlest pet shop. Blythe agrees to, but is nervous. So this makes the second two-parter where Blythe has to save the Littlest Pet Shop. Although this does bring up something. If Blythe has to periodically save the Littlest Pet Shop, is that why her hours are so free? Because, like, she gets called in to save it? And then, you know, whatever else is a bit more open-ended. But, like, when we're in dire straits, gotta save it. You just gotta. So, anyway, we cut to the shoot. And Russell is wearing a tie and not really moving. Mona is angry about this, so Blythe asks Russell about uh, the poses they practice. Russell makes silly poses and Mona gets even angrier. Mrs. T is also there to remind Blythe about the certain doom that will come if this bombs. Mona is angry about Russell closing his eyes and then Blythe gets a call from Mrs. Trombley reminding her of the imminent doom. Mona is very angry with Russell closing his eyes And Blythe tells him not to, but then he gets dizzy from the flash and runs into things, which causes a chain reaction that eventually leads into the breaking of the camera. Blythe says she's really sorry, but Mona yells at her about how she has doomed the littlest pet shop, and Blythe wakes up. So, she hates that she is still stress dreaming about all of this, but is at least thankful that no watermelons showed up in the stream, so I guess that's an improvement. However, she checks her clock and notices that she's going to be late because she set her alarm at the wrong time. Which, okay, it's it's a digital alarm clock and not, not her phone, surprisingly. I mean, I guess if the charger was somewhere else and she wanted to charge it at night, a uh, digital alarm clock might be easier. I'm like, she has a phone. Like, I, I don't know why, like, you wouldn't, especially if you're in the habit of using it all the time. It's just, it's just a little weird. Anyway, Mrs. Twombly preps the pets for their ride in Blythe's scooter. So he asks Russell how he's feeling, and Russell says he's not feeling too good, But Zoe reassures him that he has a certain kind of charm about him. And it's hard for her to say, but she gets through it with a little pressure from Pepper. Russell feels a bit better about this. And Pepper congratulates Zoe on being nice. And Zoe says that it felt nice too. 
Blythe walks out complaining about how she overslept, and then she goes to hitch the kiosk to the scooter, but the hitch isn't there. Mrs. T says everyone should go to the Lilith's pet shuttle, only to find that it has a flat. With Roger on a flight, Blythe doesn't know what to do. Then a watermelon vendor comes up, and Blythe yells because the watermelon is in real life, not a bad dream. Meanwhile, in the shadows, the biscuits reveal to have stolen the hitch and flattened the tire, and they laugh maniacally to end part one of this two-part epic. So we pick up in part two where Blythe is digging through the trash to look for a spare hitch. But Mrs. Tromley has an idea and goes into the store. Blythe finds a lollipop, but Pete the Rat comes out and takes it back, claiming he was here first. Find another trash can. So Penny and Pepper tell her to be positive and maybe the answer will walk out the door. They look at the door, but... Uh, no one comes out. And Zoe says, maybe not that door, but yes, that door. Because Mrs. Twombly walks out with some equipment and one of her doorknobs. Blythe says that she couldn't possibly ask Mrs. Twombly to give up one of her precious doorknobs. But Mrs. Twombly is like nuts to that noise. And Mel works her way into turning that doorknob into a hitch for Blythe's scooter. And you know what? Good on you, Mrs. Twombly. And I know she did it because unlike Fisher, Blythe does respect doorknobs. So anyway, Blythe is saved and is racing to go to the expo. Zoe tells Russell not to worry about getting there, but Russell is worried about the photo shoot. Zoe allows Russell to use her last resort move. The Glamour Glare, which, like, uses, like, duck lips and, like, big eyes, if I remember correctly. It's, it's been a bit. This is a two-part episode, and my notes have gotten a lot more extensive since the last two-part episode, so I, I broke up uh, when I uh, write notes and when I uh, speak. So Zoe does it, and Russell attempts, but he kind of messes up. So he says to keep practicing because you'll get it. And Blythe rushes past the Biscuits limo. And they are in disbelief. So they take a fist on a stick that they have to knock on the driver's window. And Francois rolls down the window and then gets knocked on once the window is at a reasonable lower level. So the twins tell him to go faster and be ready for the next part of their plan. Blythe arrives as everyone is getting ready. Vinny wants to have a look around, but Sunil says that, that could get Blythe in trouble. Vinny says that Sunil can be no fun sometimes. So Blythe says she made it here and then realizes what this actually means and has a mini freak out. Zoe calms her down by saying that she's been looking forward to this, and Blythe says she knows and that she wouldn't be anywhere near here without you guys. And then, unlike part one, a song happens. But it is an emotionally powerful song about Blythe's journey to get to this point. And it's very nice and very pleasant and it's really good and I like it. Anyway, uh, it features a lot of flashbacks to previous episodes and there's a brief interlude where Zoe helps Russell with modeling. And then uh, when Sunil gets to his part of a verse, he says that there's nothing to fear, but then says there's actually a lot to fear, but that's actually probably just me because I'm afraid of everything. So, like I said, this is a nice positive song, and it fits in the universe just right, and I, I actually really like it. It's a pretty good song. 
So during this, they're assembling the kiosk, and with the kiosk assembled, Blythe looks on and says that it's everything she hoped it would be. Just then, announcement plays over the PA system, asking Blythe to meet at the Africa Pavilion. Blythe is a little confused because she thought they were meeting at the Moscow Pavilion for the photo shoot, but then Zoe reminds her that Mona said that you can use all of us and you had total creative control. And Blythe kind of accepts that because, you know, that's that's right. So, do you remember when I said that we were going to get there eventually? By there, I mean we're taking another trip to Casual Racism Station. It, like, they mentioned it in the first part of the dream as well. But, like, it's stupid that there's an Africa pavilion. All of Africa. But, like, Moscow gets its own pavilion. Not even Russia, just, just Moscow. And, like... Furthermore, back in Delilah's song in part one, if that has any indication on what all the pavilions are, things get worse. So there's there's a Madrid and a Barcelona pavilion, which, I mean, cultural tensions between the two cities at this time are tensiony, and uh, you know, like they are they are different places, but. I would argue that they have more in common than, like, Egypt and South Africa do. And yet they get their own pavilions, but all of Africa. But it gets a little worse because uh, Rome and Milan have their own uh, pavilions. If uh, the Delilah's song is meant to be true there's no big geopolitical tension between these two cities which are part of italy and yet all of africa gets one pavilion it's such bull honky such bull honky i don't care like 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 i i i get like cities have different histories and like i i get it but all of africa is not the same that's not no, no, that's no, no, like, like, uh, I'd, I'd argue that this is a little more racist than, uh, like the, the, uh, okay, it's at least as racist as white people putting on a Chinese accent. It's at least that racist, if not more, and it's super dumb. All of Africa, come on. Come on, you know better than this, hopefully. Come on! Anyway, pulling out of Casual Racing Station, Vinny asks if he can go with them, but Blythe says it'd be better if they stayed behind. Zoe is a bit upset she doesn't get to go, but Pepper and Penny give her a look, and Zoe calms down about the issue. Sunil brings up the fact that there's no good place to stay in the kiosk, but Blythe turns it around and opens up a little area for them to stay in that is uh, padded with a bunch of pillows and stuff. And uh, the pets go in and relax a little bit. And Penny makes the comment when she's laying down on one of the pillows. Uh, so soft, just like Sunil's belly. And everyone's like, what? And Penny says, did I say that out loud? <laughs> I love, I love that line. I love, I love, did I say that out loud humor? It's really great. <laughs> and it's just so, so weird. Oh, oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Uh, uh, maybe this is why Penny didn't want to tell an interesting story. Because her only interesting story is testing out the bellies of their other pets and that's a little weird 
Oh god, I love I love <laughs> this line. It's like also I did not know we were already on Penny Ling's grinning streak. <laughs> I mean I'm on a grinning streak after that line. I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, Blythe tells Russell that they should get going because Mona hates it when people are late. And when they are gone, the biscuits come along and take Blythe's kiosk and talk to each other about how Blythe left her kiosk alone so someone could come and steal it. But we should take it so that no one else can take it. And <laughs> if there's one thing I'm learning from Month of Monsters is do not question the theatrics of cartoon villains. <laughs> so Russell says he forgot something at the kiosk, but when asked what, Russell says that uh, that Zoe can do this for me. Blythe tells Russell that he should work on getting over his fears, even though he's more of a behind-the-scenes guy. Being out in the open can be a little good, too. So just then, Francois in disguise comes up, and Blythe apparently went to the Ash Ketchum School for identifying people in disguises and thinks that he is Mona's photographer. Francois starts taking pictures, and Russell starts really getting into it. Blythe asks where Mona is, and Francois says that she's running late, which Blythe finds a little weird. Anyway, Vinny is bored from being in the kiosk, so he breaks out, and Sunil says that someone should go after him to keep him out of trouble, and Zoe, Pepper, and Penny look at him like, you're his boyfriend, even though they don't say that. <laughs> and that's sort of in question at the moment, but, like, it's kind of implied that, like, you two are, like, the closest. <laughs> There's no doubt about that, at least. So, uh, Sunil goes, and the rest of the girls look at Minka and asks if she's okay. Minka says she'll be fine as long as she has space. Minka reminds them of what happened when they were in the dumbwaiter. <laughs> but Minka says, so long as I can leave at any time, I'll be fine. But the door closes... And the biscuits begin to move it. Brittany asks where they're moving it. And Whitney says just to move it and we'll figure it out. But Brittany immediately questions her ability to do two things at once. Sunil and Vinny see that the kiosk is being towed and panic. Sunil says that they should alert Blythe. But Vinny says that by the time they find her, they won't know where the kiosk is. So they should tail them. Francois continues to take pictures of Russell, and Russell continues to work it. Blythe is a little confused about Russell's posing, and Blythe asks Russell what he's doing. Russell says he's using his charm, and that Zoe was right. He had it in him all along. And then he performs a pose he calls, Night in the Burrow. Just then, Blythe gets a phone call from Mona, asking where she is. Blythe tells her that she's at the Africa Pavilion, but Mona is at the Moscow Pavilion, just like she said. Blythe says she's getting photos done, but Mona says that it's not by her photographer. Mona says that her free time is no more, and that maybe the photo shoot wasn't worth your time after all. Blythe begs to come for it at the last minute, but Mona has hung up at this point. So she sees that the photographer is gone and asks Russell where he went. Russell didn't notice and says he was going to break out the glamour glare and asks not to tell Zoe. So Blythe takes Russell and leaves. So the biscuits leave the kiosk in a storage closet and that's where Brittany asks about the plan. So their plan in all of this is to pass Blythe's kiosk off as their own get the judges to give them prizes and stuff. And Whitney clarifies that they plan to find an empty space to put the kiosk. And uh, this is only a temporary solution. Vinny and Sunil have tracked where it is to go and reassures the girl about their situation. We see that inside Minka is losing it just a little bit. Vinny and Sunil notice that the door is a bit too big for them to open. However, Vinny tries to slither under the door, but finds that the space is a little too tight. And Sunil attempts to help by pushing Vinny, but it really doesn't. 
Sunil says that they should get Blythe, but Vinny says that we don't know where she is. An announcement plays, and Zoe has an idea. So she tells them to listen up, and Sunil listens to the door, and Vinny kind of gets into Sunil's ear in in a very cartoonish gag that I appreciate. So Blythe arrives at the Moscow Pavilion and begs Mona for another chance, but Mona isn't having it and says that you need to keep your appointments. Blythe wants to explain, but Mona says that there's no room for excuses in the fashion industry, and maybe she's not ready for this. So Mona then calls out to Liechtenstein. So back to casual racism station. There's a Liechtenstein pavilion, but only one pavilion for all of Africa. I mean, come on. What what do you got what <laughs> This just makes no sense. Like, like I would, I would, I kind of get why they use white people for Chinese accents. Cause like, I mean, like they don't know where to look for Chinese actors or there might not be a lot of Chinese actors in the city they are, but they probably are, but they just don't know where to look or they're kind of small scale and they don't want to you know, fumble around or whatever, like, like, not great reasons, but they're, they're somewhat tangible, somewhat understandable. This I just do not get. I just do not get at all. So, so, I mean, I, I'm sure Liechtenstein is like a nice place and all, but like, like, why does all of Africa get one pavilion that's just absurd and i know like there are some places in africa that have like bad gdp and stuff but like there are other places that do not and it's just it's just dumb it's just really dumb so Vinny and sunil are racing to find the announcer's room Delilah calls out to them and says hello. Uh, Sunil falls into Gaga mode, especially after Delilah gives him a pet name of Sunny and roams around him and wraps her tail around him. So Vinny urgently asks if she knows where the announcer is. Delilah says she does on account of her being here before. She asks if they want to be escorted there and they say yes. Delilah says to walk this way, and Sunil begins to walk behind her on all fours like Delilah is. So I guess we're ripping off young Frankenstein now. And Vinny is just a little annoyed. So, in the kiosk, Minka is freaking out, and Zoe says that she thought this would never happen again. But Penny tries to be positive. However, Minka freaks out some more, and they all want to get out. Blythe is bummed about the fake photo shoot, but Russell tells her to focus on the kiosk. I'm going to say from here on out, things get a little fast paced. So Blythe figures he's right and begins to prepare, but then notices that her kiosk is missing. Russell finds Penny Ling's bamboo snacks, leaving a trail for where they should go, and they give chase. Vinny asks Delilah if they're there yet. Delilah says maybe, but maybe not, and Sunil is a little more infatuated. Russell and Blythe follow the trail, but it stops at an intersection, and they don't know where to go. Emma, Youngmi, Sue, and Jasper come up to them and asks, Hey, what's going on? Blythe tells them about what happened with the photo shoot and with the kiosk and how she's freaking out. So then Delilah arrives in the announcer's room. She saunters over to the announcer, and the announcer asks what's up. But Delilah steals her notes, and the announcer gets angry and gives chase. So, uh, Vinny and Sunil sneak in, and Vinny asks Sunil to make an announcement. Sunil freezes up, and then Vinny says, like I always say, If you want to do something right, get a lizard. 
He then begins his announcement with tasting, tasting, one, two, three. Hey, this microphone actually tastes pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I like, I like that line too. He then asks Blythe to come to the storage room, and Blythe is a little relieved and asks if they heard the announcement. Young Mi said that she couldn't understand it, and it kind of sounded like a gecko call. Blythe runs off, and her friends are confused. However, Emma is impressed that Young Mi knows what a gecko call sounds like. So, Blythe and Russell meet up with Sunil, Vinny, and Delilah at the storage closet. Blythe asks, what's going on? And Vinny explains that the biscuits stole their kiosk with the girls locked in, and it's in the storage closet. Blythe opens it, only to find that it's gone. So the biscuits prepare for their evil scheme to come to fruition. The girls are worried because the biscuits moved them, and they come up with the idea to make some noise to attract attention. Pepper has that covered, as she has been covering Minka, but unleashes her to make things noisy. The biscuits hear this, but it does not deter them from this plan. So, uh, they put a label over Blythe's label on the kiosk, and the sign now reads, Biscuit Twins Pet Design Animal Fashion Stuff, and they say that it could use a few more words. Blythe and company are running through the expo hall, trying to find the kiosk. And the biscuits are applying makeup when the judges arrive, and they begin the interview. When the interview asks where they got their inspiration, they say, you know, stuff. So the interview is a little awkward, but it goes smooth for the time being. So, uh... They're still looking, but Russell sees the kiosk on the big screen as the biscuits are being interviewed. Blythe, in a rage, knowing where the kiosk is, rushes down to stop this, using her purified biscuit powers to run as fast as possible to get there without making a sound. And as Mona is about to award them best in show, Blythe comes in with her accusations of stealing. The biscuits push back and say it's theirs because it has their name and just the right amount of words on it. But Blythe says that she can prove that her kiosk is hers. So she shows off outfits that were inspired by her trips to Rio, uh, Paris, and Shanghai. Which, back in uh, Shanghai Jinx, I said that I would say... Uh, like, if it is or is not appropriation, and I'm going to leave this as a maybe? I don't know. It It's it's weird. I don't... It, it looks more like professional look that's sort of Chinese. Um, I don't know. It looks more... Mo it doesn't look traditional or ancient. It looks kind of modern-y. Like, it's, it's hard to tell. It, it's very much of Shanghai, but it's not... Um, it, do, it doesn't seem like it's appropriating anything. Also, the costume she has for Rio is that of a Rio dancer, which is kind of weird in its own right. And says that because she has these outfits and she's been there, these outfits were inspired by those trips and everything else she's seen and done throughout this year. And that also her pets are inside and she flips it over, opens the door, and Minka explodes on the biscuits and it messes up their hair and makeup. The rest of the pets come out and hug Blythe. Mona wants an explanation for all of this. And Francois comes over and says that he can explain. Blythe points out that that was the photographer, 
But Mona says she's never seen this man in her life. Francois takes off his disguise, and Blythe is shocked that it's Francois. Francois explains that he was forced to distract Blythe while the biscuits stole the kiosk. When Blythe asks why he did this, Francois explains that he is a 17th generation butler and is pledged to serve as absolute, but his pledge to honesty should be stronger, and he admits to trying to take good pictures of Russell. Mona wants to have a look, and Francois gives her the camera, and she is very impressed with the pictures that Francois took. The biscuits fire Francois, and Francois said, Yeah, I thought this would happen. But Mona says, Don't worry, because I want to buy these photos from you. And this would be perfect for an article about Blythe and the Littlest Pet Shop. Blythe says that Mrs. Twombly can stop worrying about a new largest ever pet shop. But Mona laughs at this and says that Fisher says he's going to open a new store whenever he thinks a competitor is getting too big. And the twins are shocked at this. And I just want to point out that Fisher thought he could scare Mrs. Twombly Mrs. Twombly, who's been around the world because she's created her own martial art, who plays Mahjong regularly, who has a sister in Antarctica, who's tough as nails, unpredictable. You thought you could scare her? Fool, don't you know? You're, she's not trapped in this industry with you. You're trapped in this industry with her. And, and then Mona comments that the rotten apples don't fall far from the tree, apparently. So the judges award Blythe with Best in Show, and Emma, Jasper, Young Me, and Sue come up to see this, and chair Blythe on, as does Roger, who is very excited and says, that's my daughter. That's my daughter. I love you. I love you, Roger. You're, you're just so great. So, in the kiosk, the pets are preparing and getting dressed, and Zoe admits that Russell's photos are great. Russell says that he couldn't have done it without her, and they have a nice moment. And then Blythe invites them out, and they begin modeling. And along with Mona's usual photographer, Francois is also there, and he is getting really into it. But he is taking good pictures, though, so I guess it works out. Plus, you just got freed up emotionally. So I guess that makes sense. And the episode ends with Blythe and the Pets being on the cover of Très Blasé magazine. And what a way to end it. Okay. So, there is something about this episode that I absolutely need to go over. So, this episode, as I've walked it through this time, I have noticed something about it. It is pretty much a culmination of elements from previous episodes of season two. Pretty much, like, all of them. Like, like I have the list right here, and I'm going to run down this uh, list now. So, Missing Blythe. It introduces the Littlest Pet Shuttle, which is a plot element here, and the design for the pet bag, which shows up here and is what uh, gets Blythe on Mona's good side. <laughs> So in Nest Hat's craze, it's about Blythe being in the public eye and the Biscuits trying to tinker with that and Russell stepping up the plate on something. <laughs> Eight arms to hold you. Vinny and Sunil trying to get into some place and Russell freaking out about one of his insecurities. Heart of Parkness. We have Fisher having a big plan for something and Sunil being afraid of everything, which was mentioned slightly in this episode, but we're going to count it. Palm reading. It's Blythe proving someone of wrongdoing on a large scale 
and doing it with a bunch of energy. <laughs> so, uh, Treasure of Henrietta Twombly. So it's the biscuits trying to take something and run out a Twombly. In What Mean Worry, we get Zoe getting jealous of someone. In Big Feathered Parade, we have someone stealing Blythe's design and a reluctant assistant with the stealing turning face and calling out the stealer. Day at the Museum, it mentions the call out of the fantasy. Alligators and handbags, it introduces Mona and Trey Blase as a plot point and stuff like that. Blythe's big idea, it introduces the expo, Blaith's kiosk, and the hitch that was stolen. Uh, commercial success. Blaith working with someone with an unfavorable temperament. So interesting. Someone doing something just because they're really, really mean. To Paris with Zoe. It introduces Emma, and they go to Paris, and Blaith gets inspired by it. Uh, Super Sunil. It's the Biscuits trying to be the best with minimal effort on their part and getting assisted by someone who works for them. <laughs> Sweet Pepper, we have a pet falling in love with another pet almost instantly. In Shanghai Hijinks, Blythe going to Shanghai, being inspired, and Mrs. Twombly proving how tough she is, that she's willing to stand up to this using Blythe even. And yeah, Blythe supporting Mrs. Twombly, why did I not top that? I just thought of that now, that's why. So, grounded, we have Zoe freaking out about her status, Minka not getting enough space, and the Biscuits reinforcing their hatred of Blythe. Inside job, the Biscuits attacking Blythe to protect their dad's money. Plain and Rio, Blythe designs getting stolen again and getting outside help from someone, and also getting inspired by Rio. In Little Bigfoot, we have the Biscuits again attacking Blythe to protect their dad's money, and Blythe and the pets getting their pictures taken. <laughs> We have Sunil's sick day. We have someone apologizes for tricking someone, and Vinny and Sunil kind of, you know, there's a little bit of tension there. In Hedgehog in the Plastic Bubble, we have Blythe getting carried away with her fears. Stand up stinker. Blythe is asked to enter a fashion contest by Roger, and it's also about someone worrying about their passion, and then... Also, it features Blythe getting chewed out, but then enforced by a celebrity. So, all of those elements appear in this episode, and I think that is great. I think that is a lovely attention to detail. I don't know how much of it is, um, you know, intentional, but I love that it's all there. It's just like, it's right there. It's all, it's all of season two, just just wrapped up in a little package it's really nice and i love it and it's just it's so good and you might be saying that this praise might seem a bit too high for all of this effort but i think it's it just does a good job and like one of the things that helps it is something i've suggested like in at least this season, I'm pretty sure it was just this season, but, like, whatever. Like, it, it just makes sense. And that is, like, this being a double-length episode. Like, like they, they take a longer amount of time to develop these plots and to sneak in these little references to all of the episodes of season two. And, like, it, like, tackles stories well it, it has enough breathing room for like all the stories and like they, they're they all fleshed out really well and like they're all understandable and fun you know and I just think that like it, it can do that and like I don't know maybe more avid listeners of the podcast can point out that uh, like this episode of the podcast has a lot of elements from you know previous times previous episodes of season two episodes like I do mention casual racism station I do mention uh, Blythe using the purified biscuit against the biscuits uh, like I don't know just stuff like that maybe there's a little more but 
I don't know. But, like, like this is just a really standout episode. Because, like, it is double length. And, like, it uses that to its advantage. And, like, like may- maybe single length episodes can work. And they have in the past. But this one just does a lot with with it and I think like like most episodes could use a little more of this so that things don't get tied up too quickly but speaking of how this episode stands uh like because of all of the little references or hints I think this does a good job at being a good season finale and it's a really good season finale. I just, I like it as that. But uh, if this were a series finale, I don't know. This feels more like a regular episode than uh, uh, Summertime Blues. Where like that, that feels more like a definitive point to end it on this feels like like i mean it's a big change in the world or it's it's like it's some something big has definitely happened but i don't know this feels more like a regular episode than it does like an ender but thankfully it's not a series ender because we have two more seasons left and like just this season and how it differs from season one is like really interesting and i i I enjoy a lot of the episodes in it there are things i don't enjoy about it obviously but like overall i think um at this point i've really come into my own like at this point i'm only like a few minutes not even like 10 minutes longer than my season one season finale but that episode was just a single part and this is a double part and if i ended at part one that would be about 40 minutes and you know i think uh i've gotten reporting on this episodes down and you know just just like this experience is like like made me better at this and you know like just looking back through all of these episodes and what i thought it's really really interesting to see where i started and where i ended up when it comes to this season and when it comes to like you know the series thus far Um, I'm going to get into more of that later in one of the bonus episodes, but I think I'll end it right now. So this will do it for the last episode of season two of Lilith's Pet Cast. Be sure to leave your comments and reviews on Shout Engine, on Apple Podcasts, on the Google Play Store, and wherever else RSS feeds go when um they have nightmares about watermelons and like with season one i'm going to be taking a break but we'll be releasing bonus content now season one had three pieces of bonus content season two will have five the three you're familiar with and two new pieces One is really only exclusive for season two, though. So, that being said, I will see you later. And hopefully, season three will provide a different experience. As much as I love this one, a new experience is likened. Anyway, thank you for listening.